just arrived back from, um, uh, flew in from Oslo, uh, Norway, where Sally and I have spent the last week uh, in uh, Norway and uh, at uh, Camp Barneo, a Russian camp uh, on the Arctic Circle, and um, actually uh, uh, the North Pole, where we were at 90 degrees north uh, for the exact North Pole. And actually, at the North Pole, uh, the North Pole moves the, uh, the exact uh, North Pole because it's on uh, ice. And while we were there, uh, renewing our vows, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, it moved about 20 or 30 feet in the two or three hours that we were there. But um, just got back, uh, been gone uh, about a week, and uh, the um, uh, and it was a. Uh, as I had mentioned in my uh, on a tweet, um, I hadn't really thought about it until after the fact when Sally and I renewed our vows uh, at the North Pole, um, uh, and it's pretty fucking special, especially when you think about that we had renewed our vows at the South Pole about three and a half years ago. So all together, Sally and I have been married five times, and um, the uh, uh, sarcastically, I was telling the uh, Norwegians, uh, the next time, uh, I'll, we'll, you know, we'll get divorced in hell. And then they told me that there was a city called hell, hell, Norway, except hell means good luck in Norwegian. Uh, but uh, it was a pretty neat experience. And, uh, you know, uh, I have a, a number of things to talk about. But in this uh, third episode of Reflections and Confessions of the $50 Billion Man, but um, we, we, I talk about perception as reality. We had stayed at the Continental Hotel in uh, Oslo before we went on the trip, and uh, then last night when we came back. And last night they upgraded us. We, we have a suite normally, but they upgraded us to the Royal Suite. Now, you, you can think about, uh, you know, why did they do that? Did they do that because um, we've been there before? Did they do that because we went to the North Pole? Did they do that because they knew that uh, we were renewing our vows? Did they do that because they knew our home address was Guthrie Castle and that we, uh, you know, maybe we were some sort of royalty? I don't know exactly why, but the bottom line is they did it. And uh, that often happens when Sally and I travel. Um, but going up there was quite a, a remarkable experience, notwithstanding that we've been to uh, other pretty strange and bizarre places over the years. But uh, now we're, uh, co we're co considered bipolar. If you can read this on my jacket, it says South Pole 2011, uh, North Pole 2015. So there are not that many people that belong to that club. And there's even fewer people. In fact, we think nobody else that belongs to the club that have been married on both poles. So we're going to be registering with the Guinness Book of Records. We've already preliminarily asked them some months ago when we knew we were going to go to the uh, North Pole to have our vows renewed. But going to the North Pole from Oslo, you have to fly about seven, 750 miles, I believe it's nautical miles, to a place called Longyear Bin, which is named after a, um, an Englishman named Longyear. And it was famous uh, about 100, 110 years ago for the coal industry. And, uh, and then you take a, another plane about two, two and a half hours north of that, which is about another 600 miles, more or less. Uh, to a place called Camp uh, Barneo, which is a Russian camp, which is on the floating ice. And you uh, normally stay there a day or two and then um, take a helicopter to uh, the actual um, uh, North Pole. Camp Barneo is in the Arctic Circle. But we were very fortunate. The weather was superb. The weather was perfect. And so we landed, and within two or three hours, we were able to take the helicopter to the uh, North Pole and uh, have our vows renewed, re uh, renewed. Now, we were also fortunate enough because we had a uh, world-class skydiver that was there uh, on the scene uh, to jump into our wedding ceremony, more or less. Uh, be, uh, and so uh, and that, that's, uh, we'll have, uh, be posting um, pictures of that on social media. Uh, so uh, we had a... Uh, uh, a, a minister dressed up as Santa Claus uh, and a Santa suit who administered the ceremony. Or, uh, and uh, so, um, and he's the same guy that actually married us at the South Pole. 
And so um, I, can't, I don't think he was dressed up as Santa Claus down at the South Pole. But uh, since we were up in Santa Claus country, uh, he dressed up as Santa Claus. And we had um, champagne and vodka and some other strong drinks. And as you'll see from the social media pictures, uh, I tried to hit a golf ball. Uh, the, uh, and it was quite a bizarre um, uh, event. And so uh, we got back uh, that afternoon, uh, taking the, the a Russian helicopter back to um, uh, Camp Barneo. And then uh, we had dinner and um, the, uh, the, the, the various people stayed up to the wee hours in the morning. I only stayed up to about 12.30, then I got up again after a few hours sleep, and, um, whereas a number of people stayed up all, uh, most of the night. Um, the weather was pretty good. It was only got down to about uh, maybe 18, 20 below zero. That's centigrade. <clears throat> and uh, there was very little wind. And uh, so uh, the, the gods were uh, looking down upon us for this uh, uh, wedding ceremony that we had. And so it, it, it was quite an event. But one of the things that became very clear to me while I was there is um, the, well, a number of things. Number one, the Norwegians are tough bastards. And uh, I'll tell you some stories about Vikings uh, in a couple minutes. But they're all tough. They're hardy people. I mean, hardy. And uh, the, um, they just are. And uh, the uh, one day, uh, Sally and I went dog sledding, which the pictures have already been published on social media. And uh, Sally was the passenger and I was the driver. Well, let me tell you, that's not an easy job, driving a sled. I used to think it was easy until I did it. And I mean, I was sore in a lot of different places uh, the next couple of days. And uh, the dogs who, there's some other pictures on social media, how loving they are and they lick your face and they want to they, they, they wanna be your friend. When they get amongst themselves, they get very aggressive and uh, very vicious in, in some cases. But I had never seen anybody else break up a dog fight other than myself before. But these sled guys, these sled masters do it all the time. And so that was quite an experience, uh, uh, mushing the sleds uh, for a few hours. Now, I, I thought that was an experience until I went skidooing. I thought skidooing, which is like a motorcycle type instrument on, on snow, was a piece of cake. I thought I could do this standing on my head asleep. Well, Sally and I skidooed 120 kilometers. And if I thought I was sore from the sledding, or sledging as they call it with the dogs, I was more sore in other places um, the, um, than, I, than you can ever imagine. And the, um, it's just the, trying to balance yourself. I did not realize that these things can go, get up to 100 kilometers an hour. Now, I didn't go that fast, but the fastest I went was about 55 kilometers an hour. But uh, it was quite an experience, and again, all these guys are hardy. All these guys are tough as nails. And when you think about what some of the uh, things, the stories you hear about Vikings. Now, I didn't realize until, and it was verified both up there uh, in um, Longyearbyen and when we got back down to Oslo, that one of the reasons for the um, um, fierce fighting that the uh, Vikings allegedly did is, you know, they thought they were going to die. If they died in battle, they went to Valhalla. Well, that's all true, uh, apparently, uh, as story or myth would uh, uh, indicate. But the reason that they were willing to fight and die, because they thought they'd f fight, die, wake up the next day and fight again. And the, it, it, it was like uh, Groundhog Day, where it just kept happening again. It's because they were loaded. They were drugged up on mushrooms, apparently, which are, is a hallucinogenic drug. So uh, although it might have cut uh, the edge off their... Um, uh, physicality, it certainly uh, allowed them to die happy. So uh, that was interesting to hear. And uh, the, uh, a lot of tall, good-looking people in Norway. And uh, it just uh, it comes with the territory. Uh, more than once, uh, Sally was approached because uh, she's blonde and good-looking in Norwegian. And they'd ask her something and she'd respond to them in English. But she fit right in there uh, because of you know her skin, her fair skin, and her, her blonde hair. Um, so um, the uh, you know the, the, the Norwegians or the uh, the people up there in the Arctic Circle are uh, a breed under their own. Now the people that were up in the camp with us that were experiencing um, the North Pole, 
uh, you know, I talk about high performance people and I talk about how high performance people are different. Well, I'm just going to give you a random sample of some of the people that were up there. We had a, um, a guy that was the world head of uh, a, uh, the trading operation for one of the big investment banks. He was uh, taking his daughter up there for her 25th birthday. We had um, a guy that was uh, uh, special ops uh, for uh, the United States military, a retired special ops, a young guy who ran, runs a, uh, a security firm. Um, we had a retired businessman, a, a retired contractor uh, from uh, Ohio. Um, we had a um, CEO uh, of a um, world-renowned luxury brand um, that was up there with a part of his staff. We had a, um, and part of his entourage was a, uh, a big name magazine that was doing a, a, an article on them along with photographers, etc. cetera. Um, we had the uh, head of, uh, uh, minister, the head minister of geology for Kazakhstan. Uh, and they're, they're, they like to drink and party quite a bit. Uh, and um, we, we had a, a, it was a small group, but the, the, the camp is Russian-based, and the Russians all are hardy. I mean, uh, they, uh, they're just, you know, they're hardy guys, they're tough guys. Very dissimilar to the guys that you know, very dissimilar to the, the you know, I tell you, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. These guys were all hardcore alpha males. Uh, in fact, uh, we just published a um, uh, podcast, uh, Do You Have to Be an Alpha Male? I just looked at it, uh, even though I, I've edited it before. It's very good. I hope you look, watch it. Uh, and the answer is no, you don't have to be an alpha male to follow QLA. Uh, I also viewed a uh, another, not podcast, but a little teaser, two, three minute teaser from the seminar about why you're losers uh, or why you're poor, I should say. And it's, uh, yeah, well, I interface with one of my um, mentees at the seminar, a guy named Matthew, who is a uh, engineer, a bright kid, who had already experienced QLA, had already done acquisitions, had already done financing before he came to the seminar. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that until he got there, and then we talked about it. And, of course, then I used him as an example uh, a, a good many times during the seminar to show that, you know, uh, and re-emphasize and validate, or more or less validate, that 99.9% .9 of the people that use the methodology I never met uh, and I've never uh, spoken to. Um, uh, and the only reason I met him is because he decided to, to pay the money to come to the seminar because he wanted to go to the next level. Uh, and he thought that, uh, or he knew, or he hoped, or he prayed, that actually interfacing with me personally would help him get to the next level, which I'm sure it would. Matthew's a smart guy, uh, but I ranted and raved and I screamed at some of the guys there at the seminar because they were asking, uh, and this is the last day just after lunch, uh, they were asking uh, questions that they should have gotten the answers to, uh, and they were stupid questions, and so I ripped into them, uh, especially one of the kids, and uh, the, uh, because a lot of the kids and a lot of the problems you guys have, uh, you YouTubers, is you want to know the reasons why behind. You want to know uh, the algorithms. You want to know uh, the, uh, the formulas. You want to know uh, the facts behind uh, the templates and the processes and the procedures that I've put together over the last 22 years. When you don't need to, all you need to do is follow them. But anyway, I ran and raved quite a bit and um, had some shocking things to say, uh, which shouldn't shock anybody that listens to the YouTube um, uh, not testimonies, but the YouTube uh, snippets that we have uh, about the seminar. So, um, the um, getting back to the high performance people that were at the sem uh, not at the seminar, uh, but at the uh, at the North Pole, it, 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 it's it's quite indicative. The people that can afford to go to the North Pole, and it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. Although it is more expensive to go to the South Pole, which Sally and I went, went to three and a half years ago. You know, the reason that they can afford that is because they've worked 10, 20, 30 years and, and more to, uh, you know, at, at a high performance level. Uh, and, um, and they were dedicated and focused. And uh, you too uh, can do that if you stay dedicated and focused. And it's not easy to stay dedicated and focused for 10, 20, 30 years. 
So that all went well. <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that um, many of you um, are still uh, um, sending in questions and many of you are still, uh, you know, uh, have queries about um, if, if, if this is for you, etc. cetera. Um, during the seminar, or how do I get the fucking money? During the seminar, I went over that, and I think, um, right, I don't think I know that there's a section uh, uh, and part of the uh, YouTube that we published in the last couple of days that, that went over that in, in some uh, detail. The, um, uh, Sally and I continue to, to plan our, our, our trips. Uh, we've got a couple of new things to add to our bucket list, or I should say my bucket list, not Sally's bucket list. And the, uh, it's, uh, it's always interesting uh, to, uh, to hear other people that have been in various places around the world uh, that perhaps that uh, Sally and I haven't been to yet, which that list is getting uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, again, I'm in my uh, birthday present from my wife to myself, this uh, new 2015 extended wheelbase uh, Rolls-Royce uh, uh, Phantom. Uh, I neglected to say in the first uh, of these episodes, Reflections and uh, Confessions of the $50 Billion Man, uh, some of the details about the car. The wood in the car is uh, all from one tree, I'm told. Uh, the leather in the car, uh, it's hard for me to believe it's all from one cow, but uh, it must be all from the same kind of cows the leather. Uh, it takes about um, six plus months to construct the car. Uh, and I must admit, and I think Sally would agree, that it's a smoother ride than uh, our, uh, our Bentley that we've had for a few years. And so I'm, I'm happy. And it certainly has more legroom. I'm certainly happy that uh, she surprised me by giving it to me. Um, on this trip back to um, uh, Guthrie Castle from Aberdeen Airport. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing our, our, our two dogs, uh, Daisy the Great Dane, uh, or, or Dozy Daisy as they call her, and Max, our uh, loving uh, boxer. Uh, but I was extremely surprised how loving all the, the, the sled dogs or even strange ones, because when you go to a restaurant, you go someplace, you tie them up outside on these kind of railings they have. And um, the, these dogs, you go up to them, and I mean, and I've got some pictures where they they want to paw you, they want to rub their head on you, you they want you to scratch them, and they want to lick you. It's it's quite amazing how friendly they are. Yet when they get out in front of those sleds, they they get ferocious, they get vicious, uh, and um, the uh, I can't imagine uh, how these uh, the, the the dog sled races that are like a thousand kilometers long, both in Alaska and in that part of the world. I mean, I have, uh, you know, all the uh, kudos possible uh, uh, that exist uh, to those guys that do that because, you know, you do that for two, three weeks, uh, a month, five weeks, it's gotta be an extreme strain on your body. Uh, now, when I was on the uh, uh, skidoos, <clears throat> I almost fell asleep a couple times, which I was telling Sally. Uh, I got mesmerized by the white snow out in front of me, and somehow I'd be just thinking about things, or I'd be thinking about the mentees, and, and try to keep my focus. And all of a sudden, I find myself uh, my head nodding because it's it's so mesmerizing out there in the middle of all these kilometer after kilometer of nothing but white snow. Uh, and it got pretty windy uh, when we got um, to the end of our trip which was about 60 plus kilometers, and then before we turned around. Now, in, in, in candor, I would be disingenuous, and I'd be uh, uh, well, worse than disingenuous if I didn't tell you, at the end of 60 kilometers, I was ready to pack it in, and I wanted to not go back those the last 60 kilometers back, especially since we were going into the wind. But not much I could do, but uh, suck it up and do it. And so, uh, of course, Sally was on another uh, skidoo, uh, and uh, so I'm hardly going to ask Sally to get on her skidoo and have her drive me back. 
Uh, and what would we do with my machine when we're out there in the middle of nowhere? But I mean, it was hard, you know, and uh, anybody that says that it isn't, it hasn't done it before. Just like many of the things I talk about um, on the podcast, many of the things I talk about in the seminar, uh, many of the things that I've written about on blogs, uh, newsletters, and in my book, uh, most of the information that you're getting from these guys and gals uh, that tell you how easy it is to be effective as a high performance person is all horseshit. Uh, and uh, you can tell that it's horseshit because they say it, and uh, when you, when you, when you isolate who they are, what they've done, uh, it's easy to tell that the money that they've made, or a vast majority of the money that they've made, has been uh, made by putting asses on seminar seats, um, or uh, and or writing books, uh, etc. But not in the uh, cutthroat world of business uh, and uh, uh, that and rough and tumble that I've been in the last uh, uh, almost 50 years. The um, I wanted to comment, uh, I'm continuing on to do my uh, podcast, this last podcast, not this podcast, but the podcast that was just published about, do you have to be an alpha male, it was a special podcast. It was slightly, not out of sequence, but I think we're at at about number 13 or so, and uh, from time to time I will still do special podcasts, Um, and uh, and we will do those to uh, the end of this uh, calendar year, uh, 2015. the, uh, we may change the podcast format slightly um, next year, 2016. Now, we have the uh, June seminar coming up, which is June 1 through um, uh, 8. Uh, it's still not quite f- uh, full, uh, but uh, it's obviously uh, going forward, uh, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Now, I mentioned as a throwaway line, a, um, during the um, April seminar that just finished about a week, 10 days ago, that I had not, this part isn't throwaway, when I said I didn't really realize that the seminar started on April Fool's Day, went through Good Friday, Holy Week, and Easter when I set it up. I obviously realized it a couple of days before April 1st because it was brought to my attention, yet the seminar was oversubscribed. So as a throwaway line, uh, the second or third day of the seminar, I mentioned that, um, you know, maybe I should have one over Christmas. Um, and uh, I was on half serious. I was being, uh, as my wife would say, a cheeky monkey. You, you can Google that to see what that means. But uh, I was being a smart ass. Well, subsequent to that, we got several responses back, uh, not just from the people that were at the seminar in April, uh, not just people that were uh, uh, alumni of the Castle Seminar, but some other people that uh, had never attended the seminar, they said they were up for a, uh, a uh, Castle experience over Christmas. So tentatively, um, we're planning for a Christmas New Year's seminar that will start on New Year, uh, excuse me, Christmas Eve, go through Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Boxing Day as they say here in the UK, which is the day after Christmas, all the way through New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, um, and uh, the day after New Year's uh, on the 2nd of January, which will mean it will be an 11-day experience as opposed to 8-day. It will be uh, 10 nights as opposed to uh, 7 nights. Uh, And uh, we are planning something very special. it will not be the normal format for the Castle Seminar. In fact, it will be a completely new format. We will assume that you understand that there's um, pain and sacrifice to be a high-performance person and that uh, you've got a lot of fucking emotional baggage and that your parents fucked you up. We'll, we're going to assume all that, although we may spend maybe an hour in the beginning just brushing over it. Uh, and we will uh, have new material uh, for, uh, I think, uh, our, my marketing head called it QLA Hardcore, uh, where we're going to actually go through examples, uh, how to utilize, um, QA, QLA methodology, both in fixing problems within your company, uh, and, uh, making acquisitions, uh, finding finance, 
uh, it'll go beyond the role play that we currently have for uh, uh, financial institutions. It will go beyond the role play we currently have for acquiring um, uh, success fee accountants and lawyers. It will go on, go beyond the role play that we currently have uh, for acquiring a, a, a chairman and mentor. Uh, it'll be uh, much more detailed uh, and it'll be uh, much more uh, uh, verbal interfacing between myself and uh, yourselves. It will also double the time, the private time that you have with me to discuss your own private issues. Uh, the, uh, from the seminar that we just gave, we have, if my memory serves me correctly, we already have three or four people that want to sign up um, and, uh, and they just attended. Um, and so um, we're looking forward to that. We've already, Sally and I have already told the kids that um, we're not going to be having Christmas. We're going to celebrate Christmas late. Uh, and that um, uh, probably nobody watching this uh, podcast, other than, the, in fact, I don't think anybody has ever seen what the castle looks like at Christmas uh, inside and how it's, uh, we tart the old girl up uh, unbelievably uh, with Christmas trees and decorations. Uh, there'll be uh, special uh, gifts for the uh, the attendees, uh, the um, special meals uh, for the attendees during that time. And if we get any kind of um, luck, uh, it'll be snowing. And Guthrie is a fucking unbelievable place in the snow at Christmas. Uh, and uh, uh, and I won't be any more reverent during Christmas than I was over Easter. Uh, and I, uh, but it'll be a, a new, a new, a new level. And uh, the, um, I assume it'll be successful. And um, then uh, perhaps maybe once a year we'll have something like this, uh, QLA Hardcore, um, because we certainly have an, a, a number of people that have attended the, the Castle Seminar one, two, three times, uh, five, six times. Of course, Bavarian Bob, Robert from Passau, Germany, 10 times. Uh, um, uh, another Robert, an American Robert, 12 or 13 times. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, and we know why they continue to, to come back, but we want to take it to the next level. Uh, not be just because we have a lot of people that continue to come back, but we want to take it to the next level because um, there's, there's a lot more to learn. Now, we, um, the, these reflections and um, confessions of the $50 billion man, um, as I'm taping this, the first one is about ready to go out. Uh, and uh, I've had uh, some additional invitations to do other uh, podcasts. Uh, we're looking at them. Uh, carefully uh, to see uh, how I can add value and how what information uh, that I might add can add value to you guys that uh, listen to me. Um, the um, but for right now um, the this podcast reflections and uh, uh, confessions um, is the only addition that I'm planning. Now somebody asked me in an email here recently. They say, Dan, you uh, were um, expelled from uh, uh, grammar school uh, three times before you were 10. Could you elaborate on that? Well, since this is confessions, I, I can elaborate on it a little, although I elaborated in some detail at the seminar. Um, the, um, and as I mentioned, I believe uh, before uh, in the YouTube, we've had a lot of kids from East LA attend, not a lot, a handful of kids from East LA that have attended the seminar over the years. But we've never had anybody that attended the seminar that came from about three, four, five blocks down the street from where I came from. We have a, a guy now that just finished the April seminar. His name is Jose. Uh, he's a um, real estate uh, developer. Oh, he's about 20 years younger than I am, but he came from the same shitty neighborhood. And arguably it was shittier when he lived there 20 years later. Um, but uh, the, he um, 
it's not clear whether he went to the same grammar school I did, but I, I would imagine he did because he, he lives so close. But when I went to that grammar school, uh, I got thrown out uh, the first time for punching the kid in the, in the face for, and breaking the glasses in his eyes. And in those days, glass was real. Uh, and unfortunately, fortunately, he didn't lose his eyesight. Uh, the second uh, incident, uh, and I'm not bragging about these, I'm just telling you because I was asked. Um, just to show you where my head was when I was, you know, in grammar school. Uh, the second guy, I uh, broke his arm in uh, six or seven places on purpose, not by accident. Uh, and uh, the third one, and the one that I'm more or less infamous for, uh, is I dropped an aquarium from the second floor to you Brits, the first floor, onto my teacher, uh, who was on the ground, on the, on the ground, and if he hadn't moved five or six or seven inches to the right or to the left, I wouldn't be sitting here in my uh, extended wheelbase new roles uh, giving a uh, podcast on my reflections and uh, uh, confessions. Uh, I'm sure my life would have been changed because I'm sure it would have probably killed the guy as opposed to just uh, dislocating his shoulder. Uh, so uh, fortunately for me, my dad and my mom move me out of that neighborhood before I could get into any more trouble. Although I did find uh, ways to find uh, to get in trouble. And, and, I've, and I've commented, um, the, um, I volunteered for the draft uh, at the height of the Vietnam War, uh, which wasn't a, a sign of uh, being an, uh, a genius. And um, the, um, because I saw my life had, uh, didn't have any future. And um, I flunked out of university three times. And I was just getting in a lot of trouble. And so I, as a 20-year-old young man, I volunteered to go in the service in the Army. And um, the uh, and I was fortunate enough to pass the test, even though I was I didn't think I was a, such a great student. Passed the test, and I was accepted and asked to go to Office Candidate School. And that changed my life. And um, I was commissioned in July 1967. And by the act of Congress, United States Congress, I was deemed an officer and a gentleman, uh, which um, the, uh, I very much uh, tried to live up to ever since. But that was my first high performance act that I did anything. And the, the, since then, the world uh, has more or less been my oyster. Uh, and I've tried to live every day as if it was the last two minutes of my last Super Bowl ever since. I worked very hard at it. Uh, I also, uh, while we were gone, uh, commented uh, that uh, Sally and I have more choices in life because we worked, me, about 50 years, and Sally, uh, more than 30 years, um, to uh, have more choices. We, we accumulated assets, and, and uh, we enjoy ourselves immensely. And just as we just renewed our vows in, uh, at the North Pole, uh, and not many people do stuff like that. And uh, just as we you know, went on three or four safaris last year, uh, and we went on two or three or four cruises last year to exotic places and just as we'll do the same uh, this year because we've worked very very hard and um, and when I comment that I I know from my mentees worksheets every week I get that I work more hours than three quarters of my mentees that go to the seminar three quarters I work longer hours than they do and uh, I, I was asked uh, uh, at the London Ritz uh, event that I did for uh, London Real uh, um, about two, two and a half weeks ago, are you saying, Dan, that it takes long hours and you can't do it unless you work long hours? And I made the comment to Brian Rose and the audience at the time, well, if there's a way that you can do it and not working long hours, I don't know what it is. And you come to the wrong guy. I'm not the right guy to help you, teach you, mentor you, guide you, coach you, whatever word you want to use. I'm not that guy. I don't know those. I don't know those methodologies. I don't know those processes. I don't know those procedures. And after almost 50 years of working, I don't know anybody that knows them. So if that, I hope that answers your question, because I get a lot of a lot of not flack. That's the wrong word. I get a lot of discourse from kids. Um, in fact, I just met with a uh, a young kid uh, in Oslo before we took off. Um, he uh, went to the seminar about six months ago. Uh, he, 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 uh, he, he took a bus from uh, Sweden, where he lives, 
to meet me for half an hour in Oslo before we went to the airport. And he's, and he's struggling, uh, trying to uh, put get traction in what he wants to do. And, uh, and so I said, it's not unusual to not know exactly what you want to do. But I can tell you, whatever you choose, if you don't love it, if you don't have passion for it, I assure you, it'll get old sooner than later. And I say that for all you kids out there. If you don't find something that you have passion for uh, and that uh, you love, that it's going to get old sooner than later. You know, when you work hard and um, the, uh, you don't like what you do, it's called tedious work. If, if, if you spend the same hours on something that you love, I mean, it, it's, it's called passion. And uh, I'm fortunate the last 22 years that I found uh, a, a second life, so to speak. It's really not my second life. It's my third or fourth life and uh, passionate and dragging you kids across the goal line. It's just like, you know, uh, I could be taking a nap now as opposed to uh, doing this uh, Reflections and Confessions of the $50 Billion Man. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, Grant Cardone for introducing me to this, to this methodology. I mean, it's an easy gig. I'm driving in the car uh, and uh, I'm not having to look at the, at the road and uh, I can talk with these cameras. Uh, and uh, it was also uh, reinforced when uh, the young man that uh, went to look at the Rolls Royce dealer in um, in uh, London uh, uh, smell the, the leather, uh, which we have a contest on right now, uh, to the Rolls Royce dealer at age 16. Um, and uh, those two things, those two events, gave me the idea to have these podcasts. Um, I think uh, that's enough for today. Uh, I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. Um, I'm sure I'll do another, uh, well, I'm not so sure I'll do another podcast between now and the seminar in June uh, in the car like this, but I look forward to seeing you uh, in, uh, for those of you that are coming in June. And uh, God bless, peace.